uh, everyone. Um, before we start the meeting, can I ask members and officers um, who, who are here in physical attendance, uh, if you've got an electronic device, to mute it in order to avoid any feedback. Um, any remote participants, um, could you keep your camera and microphone off unless you wish to speak? And ideally not use the camera facility at all, as this can affect the quality of the meeting. Please be advised that the meeting is being recorded and data collected during the recording of the meeting will be retained in accordance with the Council's data retention policy. The recording of the meeting may be added to the Council's website. Members accessing the meeting remotely should use their SBC or KCC laptop to participate virtually. If you join using the link on the website or on a mobile and tablet device, it is not always possible to identify you and you may not be recorded as in remote attendance. Can I ask members to speak loudly and clearly? Uh, and it may be necessary to stand closer to the OWL system in order that remote participants can hear clearly. So can I welcome everyone to the Environment Committee meeting, including any visiting members attending remotely and any members of the public. The following staff are in attendance in the meeting room. Uh, the Head of Environment and Leisure, Martin Cassell, the Climate Change Officer, Janet Hill, the Mid-Kent Environmental Health Manager, Tracy Beatty, the Senior Scientific Officer, Claire Lydon, uh, the Active Travel Coordinator, Adrian Oliver, and Philippa Davis and Billy Attaway from Democratic Services. There is no fire drill planned uh, tonight, so if the alarm sounds, you should leave via the exits indicated uh, to the left, and there's one at the rear uh, behind uh, where, we're, where we're sitting. Um, please, um, if there's anyone who requires any assistance, you should make yourself, yourselves known uh, now, please. Um, are there any apologies for absence and any substitutes? Thank you, Chair. There's apologies from um, Councillor Eddie Thomas. Thank you. Is there anyone attending remotely? No. No. Can I just point out that Oliver Eakin and Pete Neal, councillors, are both not remote. Right, OK. I, I can't, yes, you can see that more clearly than me. <laughs> Fine, thank you. Um, can I ask the uh, committee to approve the minutes of the meeting held on the 3rd of October? 2022 as a correct record. Okay, thank you, members. Uh, are there any declarations of interest? No. So um, the next item is item five, um, which oh, hold on a minute. Tell you which page it's on. Yeah, so on page five, item item five, uh, climate and ecological emergency annual report. And I'm going to ask uh, Janet Hill to introduce the report for us. Good evening, councillors. Um, I think you you know the background for why we're doing this as part of our. Um, Emergency declaration. We put in um, that we would. Sorry, we, we, um, <laughs> we put in. I'm going to try to focus shouting. I'm not shouting this evening. Um, we we um, put in a clause that we would have an annual report to council in January every year. So this, so we've only been doing this for three and a half years. This is my need. Um, tonight, this, this is very much a draft report. You'll, you'll see if you've got colour versions that there are some art protector in red, they're all to be changed. Um, there's, and there's also some notes. Um, but this evening, it's, it's really to note the format that we've got it in and any suggestions to change the format and anything else you'd like to see in there. And also, you need to note the progress, and then we'll do a final 
version will go to platform for information in January. So, as you know, we declared the emergency back in June 2019, one of the first things that the coalition did, and this annual report is needed every year. And this committee asked to see the draft at this stage, so that, that's why we're here. Um, the sort of highlights of the progress this year, um, we have a very strong steering group that is made up of councillors and officers, um, right across the council, all the areas that this um, action plan touches on. We meet um, every six weeks, which is two months, progress the action plan. Um, the refurbishment of Swale House is currently underway and should hopefully be finished soon. And the Masters House um, benefited from a public electricity decarbonisation grant and the work is almost finished in there too, so that will be much more um, energy efficient for this new SFP compact running. Most of our vehicles now are EVs in the fleet, and you know our carbon footprint has gone down considerably. And the new waste contract, uh, which we're working on at the moment, is looking for alternative vehicles. So the proposal is all the same um, in our footprint. And the grounds maintenance contract, which has been running for 10 months now, has got electric vehicles and power tools. Um, the Improvement and Resilience Fund is funding projects which are helping with this emergency, including lighting, tree planting, the farm club, EV charging points, and air quality measures. We're still working with KCC to try and get a better package of measures for reducing traffic and um, improving things on the A2, but that is slow progress, but it, it is happening. Um, we've got the anti ivy campaign going on outside schools, and we're hoping to extend that as well soon. Um, we were very well scored this year by um, Climate Emergency UK. Our action plan was scored um, alongside all, all local authorities who have an action plan, which, which is the vast majority. And we were placed in the top 20 local authorities in the whole country, so that was quite an achievement. That was just on um, the action plan as it stood. Um, this time round, they're looking to look at delivery, and we'll be judged on the delivery rather than just the content of the action plan. But I, I'm, I'm confident we should maintain a similar. Um, the declaration said that we would eliminate single-use plastic. Um, from the capital operations where it's possible. We've done pretty well on that. Um, in Spoil House now, we're recycling lots and lots of the stains and just using less plastic. And um, wherever we're tree planting, we're using biodegradable. Uh, the Fuel and Water Advice Service was developed as a way of reaching our more vulnerable residents, and, and that was part of the declaration as well. But nothing in, in the declaration in which um, more residents. Um, we extended the funding for that service for one year, and you know that service it, it is so needed at the moment. Um, the the, um, the lady who delivers it is incredibly busy at the moment. Children and families managed to get an assistant for uh, funded externally, so that um, that's a really good service. Uh, so far this year, over 900 households have been given advice on energy and water. They're also um, processing people's fuel vouchers as well, which is taking a lot of their time. Um, by the off-road charging scheme, Hawks, uh, we've managed to secure funding, and my colleague Grace came to this committee in June um, to explain about that to you. Um, a very long process. But we've got uh, 10 twin chargers, so we've got 20 charging points. Um, I've, I've written this as if it was January, so it says it has been installed. And in fact, they're just starting to but they, by the time the report is complete, they will have been installed. And we're looking at, at making a further bid, but we're not quite sure. The government is changing the scheme, and we're not quite sure how much is going to pan out at the moment. Our club that started in function in May. 
has been doing incredibly well, better, better than the actual um, company who's running it anticipated. We're up to a utilisation rate of up to 50%. Um, we're hoping, well, we're definitely getting an electric vehicle within the next few weeks. And we're still not sure whether it's going to replace one of the hybrids or going to be an additional vehicle. If if Firefar are happy to put the extra one there themselves, then, then they'll have a fourth car as well, which is brilliant. We're still um, working on that. And we're also working with developers now. Quite a lot of developers um, across the borough have shown it, uh, an interest in putting car clubs in the larger housing estates. So we're working with them and we're looking at the establishment of the car club sitting board and hopefully a paper will come early next year on that. Um, the planning committee has requested uh, more renewable energy and energy efficiency measures in development and we're encouraging um, developers to achieve a 50 percent saving in carbon emissions and quite a lot of them are doing it um, and then obviously in the local plan that will bring it down over the next few years and we've written guidance which is on our website um, so far, certified standard trees and over 4,000 woods have been planted. Um, there's some more planting coming up, so by the time this report is finalised, those numbers should be increased. And then we are um, starting on the, the anticipated thing. Yeah. COVID has you know, accelerated our move to the virtual and hybrid meetings and new ways of working. And obviously, business and commuting miles fall in dramatically. There are other challenges, but I think that has always increased. Um, we're working with Penn Wildlife Trust. It's, it's been a quite long process, but we are working with them on wild carbon projects and looking at them, seeing how we can develop offsetting opportunities, both ourselves and other local organisations. So offsetting has some. Um, developing out of pace. Um, we've been looking at it for about 18 months with the trust now and it, it's quite an interesting time. It, it's evolving rapidly and there's going to be some interesting options coming forward on that. So that's our progress and basically it, it's really um, we'd like to hear from you what like to see and the changes you'd like to make. Okay, thank you, thank you, Jen. Um, so, uh, yeah, as as Janet said, to to emphasise, this uh, is is very much a, a draft, and what we're being asked to do is uh, in a bit to to note um, the format and to note the progress. But I'd like to throw it open for for, for questions. And uh, just be comments on the format, um, possible changes, and, and progress. Uh, Councillor Davy. Thank you, Chair. I've got a couple, but I'll just start with one, and then you can step over them. Um, page 19, we um, chose the centre to ask for renewable energy, and we partner chose Franklin for renewable energy. So why is the city in that potential to the challenge for safety within the borough, or is that beyond our those? We could explore it. I think one of the problems might well be that the base the base figures are always three years old. Yeah. And these figures um may be a little bit more recent. So um we, we can have a look at that. Um it, it's, it's not a simple one. Was there, was, was there a second part? Oh, I thought maybe that was part of the question, but I don't think we're not the question. Okay, well, we've got uh, Councillor Hampshire. Well, I, a, a couple of things. Um, you said about like household waste increasing. But when you actually look at like, the recycling, it seems, I assume successful recycling, you know, those that are actually able to be recycled as opposed to being rejected, it seems to have flattened. And I wondered whether you knew what the reason for that would be. Is it that the capacity issues with the bins? Is it because of the collection problems that bins are being collected? 
And if the United States sort of got a better understanding as to why the insertion rates are increasing, it would be opportunity to decide what better rates. Are you going to answer that one? Yeah, yeah I mean, it always involves back and waste, isn't it? But <laughs> I thought I might have a quite heat of it for a change. Uh, no, <laughs> um, so, I mean, fundamentally, recycling is plateaued across the country, and that is why the government are suggesting some fairly radical changes to the waste legislation through the consultations that we've spoken about. Um, we're, we're all um, aspiring to that 75% target that, um, you know, that most authorities, whether they are high performing, so there are some some of the high performers that are at 50, 55 plus, they're plateauing as well. Um, and really and truthfully, uh, everybody has come to come to that point of not really knowing the next thing to do. There are without some really radical changes. So we could um, half the size of residual bins to force people to recycle more. We could only collect residual once a month instead of once every two weeks. But none of those are really palatable ideas because at the end of the day, um, what I would say is bringing it back to Swale and why our, our um, figures, there is so much room for improvement in Swale. We did, we've just got off the press and some audits that um, with KCC and other all the other authorities we've done bin audits on, um, on all of the refuse bins, all of the green bins in Swale. And um, the results are really quite stark. They're showing upwards of 50% of our green bins include being, are, are bins that could be recycled. So we really, really need to work on our, uh, our education, on our behaviour change, across the borough, 20 odd percent of that is food waste, packaged and unpackaged. And so we talk about the climate emergency and often people go, I can't afford an electric vehicle, I can't put solar panels on my roof, you know, it's not affordable for me. And yet there are things that will make a fundamental difference to our carbon footprint that we can all do free of charge. There's a bit of change in, in our home um, and so uh, my education officer in the waste team is really going to start utilising those, those those statistics to try and get those messages out. But we absolutely implore everybody to try and help us do that. Um, so now there are some properties in Swale that um, can't food uh, can't uh, get the provision of food waste at the moment, um, and so. We've just done a trial on three roads in Sheerness to try and uh, to try and change that, and it's worked really well. We're looking to roll that out to a lot more of the exempt properties as, as well to try and do that. So there's no one thing, Nish, um, unfortunately, um, but we can all absolutely play a role. It's um, it's totally within our control to do. Do you want to come back? Yeah, yeah. If, if you yeah. Yeah. Right, thank you, Jerry. I mean, if you've got that latest data and information, I think that might be quite helpful to just kind of defend that and include it in the report. But as well as what your future action plan is for the future and how you're going to, you know, improve the project, you know, you can't always have a good news story. Sometimes it is having a what's normal report. It's the only way you can improve going forward. Um, and I take the point that there's simple changes people could make. It could be like turning the television on the standby. Coupled with the cost of living crisis that, you know, is widely reported, Actually, that could be have you know double benefit in the fact that not only does it increase the environmental carbon footprint of a household, it might also help to lower um, their, their bills. I did have another point, if I'm able to make it now, or did you want to take someone else to follow? Yeah, no, make, make your other point, and then we'll go back <laughs> to the baby. Yeah. No, it, was, it was picking up on the thing to do with like planning and. Um, a lot of reference is being made to like getting a local plan that builds in a number of environmental policies. And it seems to me at the moment that you're doing it by conditions. My question would be what legal standard do those conditions have? Because could they not quite easily be challenged in terms of viability? Um, and equally, I note that it seems to be the larger households that are pushing uh, larger house builders for the report on page 22 of 55. So 32 of the big numbers. It's sort of saying that the larger developers that are pushing back. Well, I'm not being funny. Swell is to meet its housing targets. It's going to be largely developers 
that are going to be the only ones capable of delivering that critical mass in the way in the you know the time scales that it needs to be. So that to me, I think, is a bigger issue than what this report is um, you know, paying, yeah. you know, giving service to. But it comes down to viability. You know, we have issues with it delivering affordable housing. And nine times out of ten, the developer will say, we're going to deliver X, Y, Z, the planning committee will go, yeah, that's wonderful. Mm -hmm. And then a year or two later, they come back and say it's not viable. If you take um, the latest information that's coming out of the office at the moment, with the rising interest rate, and, you know, worst case scenario, property price prices fall by up to 30 percent. I would question how viable some of these additional measures are going to be, because the ability to achieve the price, the, the sales price that the developer will need to put some of the measures that enable them to have COVID in place in the long term just might not be, in, you know, viable, financially viable for them to deliver. And so you're, you're kind of setting yourself up for a for firm. Um, and then coupled with that, because the local plan has been delayed, because consultations haven't necessarily been conducted in accordance with the rules, at what detriment is that having on Swell achieving its, its carbon reduction? And it, does it still, to, to make up the shortfall, what extra has it got to do? What has it got to do over and above? Is it still to reach that 2030 target, or is that now out of the as well? Okay, thank you, Councillor. Quite, quite a bit in there, and yeah, these yeah, aren't yeah. necessarily the officers <laughs> with, the, with the expert knowledge. Does you have you coming in? Yeah. I'm working very closely with the unconstituted people that speak the member of our team who is responsible for the climate change part of the local plan. And I don't, I mean, that part of the local plan, I, I think, is has been well developed and you know, ready to go. Obviously, the local plan can't be done and adopted in bits, so we, we've got to wait for the whole thing. But we are heading in the right direction. Obviously, the local plan will be consulted and goes to the inspector, but we are pushing. I mean, we've, we've pushed in the last one to have much higher standards than we're in there now, um, both myself and um, my counterpart. So it's not the one to try. We are we are trying, and yeah, it is a big challenge. And I appreciate you know um, to meet those things. Viability is going to be an issue. Um, I, I think you know when when if they come back, it's not for me to tell the planning committee what to do. But if they come back with those things, we we just got to stick there. If they're in the local plan, then they're in the local plan, and you know we we've got a strong case for enforcing. I mean, can, can that, it's a supplementary to the point just made. It's all very well having the policy, you know, up and ready to go. But if the actual legal document is not ready to go, then it's worthless. And I don't think the report is, you know, getting that message across clearly. You could have a great policy, but if it requires something else to happen, that hasn't happened. Then it has been delayed. It's not in place. And that's not coming, I don't think, clearly through the report. And Time scales and delivery. If something moves back a year, we don't have housing numbers. If you don't deliver, you know, your 30,000 that you meant to do every year, then year two, you have just got your 30,000, you've then got the shortfall that you need to deliver in year one, and so it builds. Clearly, I would argue that the, the same would apply in trying to reach a target. And if, if the delivery of, that you had in the pathway that you wanted is being delayed, then what are the implications of that delay? I don't think that is coming through clearly now. It, it, it's to me, it's got lots of positive things in there, and that's great. But it's, it needs to also be realistic, and it's lacking in some respects on that realism as to actually how achievable is it, how deliverable is it, and what are the impacts to the planning committee. Okay. Can that come in? Can that be noted? No, no, I mean, you, you guys know, I know I'm no planner, and there are people sit on the back end of the year that are likely to know far more than me. But what I what I can say is, is that when I'm sat in senior management teams and heard the, the updates from the planners, developers are absolutely willingly putting these measures in despite them not being the legal policy, the ground being to, to do that. They know that they need to be doing it. They're being asked to do it in other local plans where they, you know, where the cycle has already happened. 
Um, so actually, we're not seeing that pushback. And that really valid point as liability gets harder and harder, of course, there's, there's going to be those things. But um, certainly from my point of view, and I think we, we, will, we will absolutely pick that up, but it's about the opportunities of getting what we're gaining without the policy in place. And then when we get the policy in place, that's when we'll be able to much closer um, measure the impact. But you're absolutely right. It's very clear on all things climate, whether you hear it in the national news or not. Every year we don't do something, it makes the following years harder. Thank that, you. that is unfortunately the science. I'm, I'm going to move on to Councillor Simmons and then go back to Councillor Davey. Thank, thank you, Chairman. Um, a couple of comments, if I may. Um, we're, all, we're all asked this evening, but we're noting the format, noting the progress, and making some suggestions for changes. Um, and so I think, uh, generally, I, I think the report is, is good, but it's, it's well, I think it's well, well laid out. Uh, and and that's, um, that, that's very encouraging because there's an incredible amount of information. Okay. Uh, so there's lots, lots of people to look at. Um, but there is an awful lot of financial uh, information in there. Now, you know, that, may, that may be deliberate, it may, may be that it's not appropriate, but um, there's, there's talk about the uh, now, the improvement in the resilience fund, um, I couldn't see anywhere in there how much money is in, in that fund. Uh, and um, an, another thing is the question about the refurbishment of Swell House, and um, that, that being currently underway. Um, perhaps um, a bit more detail about. about where, 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 where the other, the other um, question, question really is this is this is a progress report up to January um, 2023. Presumably, uh, we will then start thinking about uh, a program and, and uh, report for January 24. These are the things. And, and I, I did wonder whether whether there was an opportunity, perhaps not this evening, but sooner rather than later, to on page 13 of 55, we've got the, the 10 high priority key actions. But, and I wonder whether, in, in view of what's happened this, this year and, and, and where we are with various things, whether, whether those uh, we would have an opportunity to look at those key actions. I can't. I can't remember. And perhaps Janet, sorry, Mr. Um, Hill can tell us um, with, whether I can't remember whether they were put in an order of priority or not. I didn't think they no, were. No, the, the top ten. But, um, perhaps uh, some of them need need some refining. Mm -hmm. Well, that, it was, that's it was, probably yeah. not for this yeah. report. Yeah. Yeah. We, we started talking at the last steering group about it, and um, we're going to look at those. I think last time we changed, we took out three and put in three new ones. Um, I think some of those will stand and some will change, and it, it's something that um, in the next week or so. Yeah. And it's important that we have those focus areas, but what that doesn't mean that the other 50 of them yeah. are not being worked on. And, you know, they don't have that, that level of high, high priority that particular year, but they're still being worked on. So I think it's absolutely for this commission to be able to input um, into um, what what makes it up then the, the next year. Um, okay. oh, sorry, yeah, could I, I mean, the question about 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 the, the, the cost, you know, the financial implications of these these things. Um, as a, a, a farmer, we're being asked to, to go to net zero um, in agriculture, and it's incredibly uh, challenging as it is for for, for individuals. 
Um, and while we, we're all in favor of um, these things, and we realize that we've got, we've got to make some difficult decisions, I don't think we necessarily voted that we were going to be poorer in the, as a result of this. And uh, I think some, some idea of what, what it's cost, what the benefits are. Okay, but that is a piece of work that we aren't doing. Standing alone, you know, when we look at what we need to do around offsetting, and um, that's something we're working on. Um, but we can. Certainly, you need to have a bit of a project to sort of solve, um, you know, yeah. consideration and the uh, uh, finance behind it. But what, what you often find is that how, how do you quantify some of the behaviour change stuff? Yeah. Um, and it's it's quite difficult. Actually, there's a group across the county called the Kent Medway Environment Group, which is uh, all of the boroughs and districts, and other public sector organisations, NHS, uh, business reps in there. Um, and we, we, we had an away day recently. In fact, Marissa's the chair of it this year. Um, so, um, and... These were all the things we were talking about. We've all got our plans, but how can we standardise some of the measurement and, and financial implications of it? Because there is absolutely, if there's 13 Janets across the borough, um, you know, they, they shouldn't all do things individually. You know, the stuff that Janet and Grace have done really well should actually be replicated in other boroughs. So it's a really positive meeting to, to come together and, and talk about, but certainly before, how, how we measure the impact was a, was a key topic of conversation, because there isn't particularly strong guidance nationally on that, um, if we're honest. Um, so, um, so you kind of need to work on that baseline, but what we have got is the original report that fed into creating this action plan. Um, and as I say, some things you can absolutely quantify, others are a lot more difficult. Okay, thank you. So I'm going to go back to Councillor Davy and I think we're to get to the end of this discussion. Yes, yeah. uh, an observation and a question, if I may. Uh, on page 29, um, the big print, right? It's got on IT, um, it says complete, paper used considerably reduced. Um, and yet we're still putting out these very fat, glossy yeah. agendas. Um, and I did have a, a quick chat with Joanne down in print. Um, she would be able to tender for much more business, which would help our income somewhat if she wasn't printing so much of this stuff. We've all got electronic devices, and if you want to opt in for an agenda, by all means, do that. You know, we four counters, 50 piles of paper. Very often they're duplicated. I think um, the, um, the SPD has been printed like four times in every agenda that we do on it. Every time it's reported, it's all printed out again. Um, so I think there may be some more work to do on that. That's an observation. I'll leave that with the team. And, uh, and my question is on, on the next, uh, on page 31. I can't remember if I've asked this before, but I have been asked to ask it. Uh, um, it's about the, uh, the green waste composting. Is this being sold on, or is it being made available for free or at reduced cost to the members of Swale? If they've got a green bin and they've been diligent and had it collected every seven or eight weeks, depending on what the frequency is at the minute. Can't just say that. <laughs> um, and that there may be some way that they can get some return on it. I, I, I'm not sure I've asked that before, but I have been asked about it. So, um, unfortunately, I think that's down to you. We had a compost giveaway last year, but not this year. Um, so, um, it is sold on the compost. Um, so, uh, KCC are the Waste Disposal Authority, Quail are the Waste Collection Authority. So anything to do with disposal sits with KCC, so they have contracts for all of the recycling with, with all of the recycling plants. And Swale benefits from some of that to, to help subsidise the cost of our service. Get payment from KCC um, for the 
that the major is paying on the common basis of the sales or some of that. A lot of it goes to local agriculture, if I'm honest, Steve. Um, um, so, uh, but certainly the, the, the compost giveaway was really, really popular. Um, and we didn't do it because it was in lockdown. We were in lockdown last year, but uh, it's definitely something we want to try and replicate. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Um, so I've got Councillor Valentine, and I'm hoping to, to end the discussion, I think. Yeah, sure. Yeah, sorry, I just wanted to try and respond to some of the, uh, the issues that have been raised. On the, on the waste and the plateauing of the recycling, um, we did um, go to a presentation to the Kent Resource Partnership a, a while back, where we had a presentation from one of the councils that was be getting uh, sort of 60, 65 percent of recycling, um, and it's uh, the way it's very clear differences. And one of the, I think, the most significant one uh, is that they used to collect garden waste for free. Um, I think they were now charging, but that meant they had a very high rate of people using the garden waste collections. So that pushes up and forth considerably. They were also a very rural area. So um, there were properties with garden to garden, so they were likely to sign up for skills. Um, the size of their residual bin was 120 litres, I think. So the residual bin is half the size of the recycling bin, which sends quite a strong sort of message as to what the expectation is. Um, I, 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 we are replacing the 118 litre bins. We still have a lot of 240s out there, but as they are breaking, we are only replacing yeah. them with 180s. Yeah. So um, that's the, that's one of the other bits. They do. And they're also they're very good on the food waste collections, which we discussed with Councillor Valentine. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. 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 Thank Yes, we're, we're trying to push through some stuff on condition at the moment. Uh, we've got lots of lovely promises waiting in the local plan review, and of course, we don't think they're going to affect until that, that, that plan comes into effect. Um, but building regulations are catching up with us. So, condition we put is for a 50% investment in 2013 building regs. We had new building regs come in last June, I think it was. And they're now 31% better than they the old ones. So the difference is, is smaller. So slowly things are catching up. Of course, we'd always like them to be uh, better than they are. I think you raise a really interesting point about viability. Um, and that's, you know, we're probably going to have to see how that goes. Of course, viability is, a, is an issue on all of these, even with our policy with their, their local plan. Yeah, it's a difficult challenge. There's a, though actually a lot of this, there's no reason really by why low carbon houses should cost more to be built than the standard houses. Um, it's the practice of the volume house builders that, you know, they're, they're used to putting in gas boilers. They've got the people who can put in gas boilers. So they haven't got all the people who can put in. Uh, but if, especially when you're putting it in, in a new build, actually that's the time when the costs can be equalised far earlier. But it's it's changing the habits and the practices of those volume house builders that's a huge challenge. Um, there was an issue about finance that was raised, and the way we set up the climate emergency is we didn't say, okay, we're going to have a program to uh, get to net zero, and here's the budget for it. Um, and we'll we'll put it through in that way. So we kind of don't account for it in in that way. But every every department and every budget that we have. Um, in in the council has to do its bit to get to net zero. So as the swell house we fit as a budget. Um, the the EV well replacing the EVs was actually cheaper than um, leasing diesel vans at the time that we did it. Yeah, I'm sure it's changed since then. <laughs> I don't know what the calculation would be today. It's probably going to be very different. It might be even cheaper. Who knows? But that's taking into account the lease and the running costs over four years. Um, and of course, we put in grants. So the Master's House got a decarbonisation grant, which was mentioned, but perhaps we should have put some information in as to how much we got that. Um, the the Orcs grant for the e EV charges was mentioned. So by being leading on these things, we're bringing in extra external funding as well. But I 
really think probably the time that's it there, but anyway. Um, and on the print, uh, I totally agree with the uh, point that uh, Councillor Davey raises. Um, and um, it is something actually that the, the finance subgroup have been focusing on when we're looking to try and make some savings on the budget. Um, something that we, there and there are, can see then that we could probably do things efficiently there. And as we suggested, free up printing to take on other work. I think we might see more of that in the future. Okay, thank you, Councillor Hunter. So I think hopefully overall we, it's been a useful discussion and help you firm up the report. We've got two recommendations to note the format of the report and suggest changes and to note progress. I hope people are happy to take them together. Is there someone who would be prepared to propose them? Got, I've got Councillor Valentine and Councillor Simmons to second. Yeah. Thank you. Are we all happy with that? Thank you. OK, so well, thank you, uh, Jenny, thank you. for bringing your report. OK, so item six is the air quality action plan. It's on page 67 of the uh, committee report. Um, is it? Um, I think I think you can probably probably sit there. Yeah. Okay, so you're, you're going to introduce them. You're going to introduce it, Claire. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to hand over to Claire, who's going to introduce the report. Okay. This year, so we're going to have um, another five year action plan, and this will be a promotion plan that we can do. Um, as part of the report that I've provided you, it has um, three parts really the, the evidence base, which includes the CAS feasibility study that we did in and this was called the proportionate study last year. And it also includes some of the recent air quality data that's in our local and um, data. I think that's um, so that was basically our evidence base that we used. So the CAS feasibility study was very useful. We went through quite a thorough consultation. There were recommendations of measures as part of that CAS feasibility study. And that has been included in the action plan update. Um, as part of the update, over the last year, we've been meeting up um, and have a steering group and team officers. Um, KCC and from SWAL, and what we've been doing is reviewing the existing um, measures, also looking at new um, measures for the next five years. We looked at the viability of these measures, um, looking at the delivery, the costs, and the air quality outcome. Um, we were also able to prioritise those measures um, in relation to their cost effectiveness uh, for non air quality benefits and air quality benefits. Um, so, as part of that, we also will be uh, information on the consultation. So, it will be an online consultation. Uh, we will be uh, sending out letters to all residents within AQMAs and near the AQMAs. Um, and um, we'll be sending out um, messages through the e bulletin um, local group also. Um, so, I don't know if anyone has had a chance to read the report. Um, there are quite a lot of appendices there. We've got them in the back there because we want to overload the of information on the report. But the main thing that we're looking for is your opinion as well on these measures. These are the measures that we want to go to consultation with. We've gone through them quite thoroughly and we're quite confident bringing forward to the Okay, thank you. Thank you, Claire. So we're, we're being asked to. Um, or basically authorise the, 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 the consultation, but you, you're keen to get some, or by the sound of it, some views now on the on the actual um, actions that are planned? Yeah, these are measures that we would like to take yeah. forward, like to um, basically get the approval from um, yeah. the Fine, okay. Um, Councillor Winkler, she's coming back. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Um, Interested in Pond Street, that's probably the most important. I understand that um, it seems to be a 
pregnancy that is pollution coming by being by the baby's crib uh, in the night hours. Now, living in Belton, not to walk back to the town in the train station. But there's not a lot of traffic in the city full street. Now, if that pollution levels are quite high, I stand by out, especially if I'm rocking it, it's obviously coming from somewhere. Now, so I think one of them is pollution coming from the recycling plant, the gas plant, and also I have suspicions that there may be a certain amount coming from the Kingsley Mill. Because I'm not some amount to read about. Never leave that thing. That's the acrid smell of something. And that is not coming from the car. That is coming from two people killed. I would suggest that's the engine that's inside. That's it. That's Yes, thank you. And um, I agree with you that pollution levels are very high. It's been continuously high for the last three years. And we've done various different studies to try and find out what the traditional source is. When we done the source apportionment study, it did identify an anomaly in the data. Usually NO2 and PM10 correlate together. So we always see the peak in the morning and the peak in the afternoon when the traffic's busy. Um, and they, you do see the increase in a lot of the peaks do occur around those times. So the majority is um, from vehicles. We are seeing some really high peaks when NO2 isn't peaking. So there is another source. And that's what we're trying to find out, basically, what that source is. We originally done a study at the Mosin Air and the SC, basically, if there was a correlation with wind direction. So we could identify an industry like that around the district to see if, it, if there was a, a location it was coming from. And we looked at the whole year and they can confirm or identify a specific location it was coming from. Um, then we've obviously done a source of portion study. We're doing a, a separate uh, study where we're going to have a low cost sensor and we're going to monitor different parts of the engine domain to see if that concentration is still as high where the residents are. But at the moment, where it's sitting, it, and also it could be non tariff type of fish. It could be dust on the road, as you know, St. Paul's is a very dusty, it's right in the middle of the industrial area. We've got all those vehicles coming through from really dusty environments. And that can just be building up on the road and being recirculated. That could be another source. Um, so that's what we're looking into to try and identify that. Um, in relation to the businesses, it could be something that we could look at in engaging with them. But it's very hard for us to pinpoint that. It's looked into that, but it's quite hard to identify those sources. But our next project we're looking at at the moment, it might actually identify that it could just be where it's sitting on the road and being recirculated and adding to the traffic concentration and then we get these really high peaks. So I think once we've done that study we'll know a bit more about sources that are sitting. We too have the same concerns as you. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Claire. Um, Councillor David. Thank you. Uh, thanks to Councillor Wiggins, I'll give the chair award. There are sources on the building side, on the sanctuary, which is our back complaints about dust, um, because the car sales uh, as they breach of air conditioning. Uh, I would know, be curious how the manager is taking further action. And my question is of observation will be on page 75. Um, about the the CAC disease feasibility plan on the A2. Now, I have leaned on that just before. I don't think we can look at a, a clean air zone, but I, I, I thought there was some, and I've raised this before, but I've not heard a copy of I believe there was some proposal for some years ago by KCC to ensure that all HDB traffic is northern Lick Road to get into. The um, Ewing rather than turn a right at Keyhole and travel down the A2 into town. Um, and the same traffic coming the other direction, it should really be used. I know they can't come up with this in conjunction with the shop, but should be using the M2. Uh, you know, look, I, I see, I've been in, uh, you know, when I was in London, there were often signs for, for heavy vehicles to use. That was the route you used. And if you were found on the route, or outreach, i.e., you know, you shouldn't be on 
in the, in the charge, the prosecution of the case. Uh, but that's never seemed to progress, and I think that may well help. I mean, I saw a learner articulate the wrong, trying to turn it left in the enclosure story. What does that do with the town? There's no need for that to be in town, to turn left and then go on part road. You know, uh, it's, we shouldn't be having HGPs in town unless they're actually physically delivered into the town centre. Again, the Europe they should be using the bypass, otherwise, why do it? So I think there needs to be work, I, nothing for us to do, I don't think it's council, apart from maybe lobbying SEC to look at the options for moving heavy industry around, around the back of the town. There's two parts that to play. No, 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 that's true. So, um, we were looking at the plan for the distribution centre, so that was something that we've been working on considering. I think when we were through to as part of the MCB, so that's definitely been on, on the spectrum. Uh, in relation to the which um, is traffic control, that could come under the traffic management uh, measure that we have for AC and that's where we're working with KCC and we're going to set up part of the groups to really get something in place um, for the districts. And so we are we're looking at things like that as well. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Claire. Um, Councillor Stephen, and then Councillor Hampshire, and then Councillor Sims. Traffic, especially HPV traffic, and then adding on agricultural traffic. I would say that area now, we're talking about the well known full stop up through far to the far. I'm sure these roads now are. Ever polluted. I mean, I live on one of them, so I know the amount of traffic that goes past. Is that an area that could be looked at? Well, yes. I say the site's quite big. If we're in the field, they're building a new factory at the moment, so they're actually noticing that they're going to put structure traffic going up. Yeah, I, I, I've been involved in one of the planning applications, and I've looked into that, and it is something, I think it's an area that we could sort of choose that to see what the concentrations are up there. So I can make note of that. We, we do a tube audit every year, so we could include that and, and measure it for a year and see what it's like down there. I mean, I, mean, I, I just noticed the student from the very significant population. I know, it's what everyone needs. Thank you, Claire. Councillor Hanshu. Uh, yeah, so looking at some of the, the ideas on how we can maybe improve air quality in that, and I noticed that you've got references to that. Um, sort of explore specific traffic management options, for example. And surely, if the Northern Relief Range linked up with the M2, that actually would help air this sort of central city wall, for example, because yeah. that would be a viable alternative to some of the more polluted vehicles that we're making reference to. But equally, can you confirm that you're ruling out the possibility of introducing the units? Because I think that would be incredibly prohibitive to the people as well, and equally to the many businesses as well. So, so you would you against the um, clean air zone? I, I think the introduction of a new lens would be very prohibitive, prohibitive to the people as well, particularly in some of the areas yeah. that we're making reference to. Yeah. And I don't think it would just be an impact on our residents, I think it would also have an impact on businesses as well. And when we need growth, yeah. I don't think that's the right policy. And, yeah. and it's the report's silent on that, yet it could be implied by some of the overarching themes. So I'm asking for, you know, whether you are pushing for you, Liz, whether you're not. That's, that's, no, we're not going for yeah. that. It's, uh, it's basically the cost uh, for the residents and the council outweighs the agency. So we're not going down that road. Yeah, yeah. In, in relation to um, the traffic management option for the normal leaf road, those sort of things are things that we, we can look into. I know that it has been picked up in the past and it's never been gone forwards, but um, yeah, that can be included in that. Thank you. Thank you, um, Chairman. Could, could I ask a couple of questions, please? Um, about, firstly, about the time scale. When, when when the consultation is, is due to go out, um, that's 
kind of related to the, to the eight week dissertation period um, by, by, by Deborah. Um, the second question is about how, how much of the information within this pack uh, this evening is going to go, go out to the residents? You know, how, how is it going to be um, presented as a, as a public uh, consultation document? So it's, it's not terribly clear at the moment uh, exactly um, how, how the consultation is going to be achieved. We've got on the page, this page 83, this is the page 4, uh, 7.7. We've got, we've got a list of prior priorities. Um, I'd, I'd be interested to know whether, again, whether those priorities are in the order in which our council would think they are, the importance of them. If, if, if they are, I would question the, the, the order of them. Um, and then we've got um, over over the page from there. We've got we've got a list of, of things which tell us questions four and nine. So then we would believe us selecting not achievable, which are not. So is, is this is it a, an electronic consultation? Yes. Yeah. 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 Do you want me to go to those points, or do you want me to? Uh, perhaps if you could just do the deal with the, the time scale of the priorities and then perhaps explain how the question is going to be laid out. Yeah, the time scales are going uh, an extra week because this is the period, but 15th of January is when it closes. So hopefully, just for tonight, it will be tomorrow up to the 15th of January. Um, in relation to the, um, the presentation of the information, so they will really there's just an introduction and then the question, which relates to each question as, um, as if you go further down in the report, you'll see that the questions relate to what they think that is achievable. And, and so it's basically bullet point questions where they can tick the box. And then they can say that they don't think it's achievable. Uh, and that's really it, the question here is just on these measures. And basically a bit of an introduction. So we don't this all this uh, additional information has been provided to the committee, but it hasn't been included in this for the consultation because it looks a bit, bit too messy. But we have made available all the information is online and we've got information on the Kentucky website uh, about the district. I think it was the other thing, the priorities that you oh, sorry. Yeah, well well evidently they're not going to be part of the consultation. No, no, the priorities um, are also not listed saying that health is more uh, important than this or that. It's not. These are the five priorities that they that um, within the action plan. So they're not uh, this is more important than that. They're just our five priorities, uh, which cover um, each section of these measures. The most important things that we think are important uh, relative to reducing air pollution and also residents' health. Thank Can I just come back to yeah, you, Jen? Thank you. Um, so how do we encourage residents to partake in the consultation? Uh, do, do we advertise it? Do we, um, for instance, is it available? People went to their local library. Could they could they fill in uh, consultation? I just think yeah. we need to do as much as we can. It's, it's a, it's a very important subject, but not one that necessarily gets people's imagination going. Well, the government is sending out a press release, um, and that will be going through the news bulletin. But yeah, we haven't really put it in any public places as such, like libraries or anything like that. Um, it would be quite tricky to get that out there. With, I don't know, maybe put a poster up, maybe it could be something like that. We could put a poster up with a link or the QR code and people could scan it. So we could do that. That's, that's not, you know, that's what I, I don't want is that we don't get many. So the bigger, the better. So we could do something like that, put something in local libraries. Good idea. But other than that, we are going to be doing a press release. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. Um, are we? 
ready to move to the recommendations. Mm -hmm. So um, we've got two recommendations that the committee authorised the head of service to undertake a public consultation on mitigation actions for the air quality action plan 2023 to 2028 uh, and to report back to the committee following the public consultation. Someone can propose this? Councillor Hampshire and Councillor Daly to second. Okay, everyone happy with that? Thank you. Okay, so item seven, which is on page 87, is the Active Travel Fund, tranche four. And Adrian, you're going to speak to us. Uh, that's, that's all yours, Adrian. Yeah. <laughs> I just get asked a difficult question. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you, Chair. Good evening, councillors. Uh, I believe we've all seen you perform at the area committees, uh, talking enthusiastically about active travel. Um, uh, a reality is, is almost upon us in terms of active travel funding and active travel funding tranche four. Uh, there's a, uh, I hope you've seen, seen the briefer notes that's, that's in your, your papers. Um, the funding. Um, well, we first heard that funding in July. Uh, we heard in July that it was going to be 710 million. And then in August, uh, Active Travel England circulated a self assessment to all uh, transport authorities for them to complete. Uh, and basically, they were ass assessing how active travel uh, uh, orientated they were. And um, so that, that's happened in August. Uh, we got the uh, results from that early in September. Um, Pence came out as a level one. Uh, the lowest level was zero, and uh, the highest level was four. Uh, Kent came out as a level one. Uh, Kent came out as a level one because it's difficult for a two tier authority to, to actually do much better than that because of, uh, a lot of the questions were about, you know, having. Uh, a wide acceptance amongst uh, amongst all members of, of of things like active travel, and consequently, when you're dealing with multiple layers of councils, it's very tricky to say absolutely we have. Um, they did get a quite positive response from Kent members, uh, so that was good news. But it is a level one, which means we're slightly down the list when it comes to uh, bidding funds. However, um, at the same time in August, they did release uh, the ambition and uh, capability and ambition fund, which is a 250 million pound uh, revenue fund, which we were expecting. It came a bit early, which is fine. Um, however, we had about five days to respond to that. Uh, we put in a bid of 165,000 from Swale. We don't know what we've got. Hopefully, we'll get something. Uh, I think I've always gone with go big, see what we get. You know. Um, and and then September came, and all as you now know, all hell broke loose at government level, and um, we were very worried about to travel England. We didn't know what was going to happen next. Um, and uh, since then, so so you know, the announcement for the fund didn't appear in September, uh, didn't appear in October. Uh, changed governments again. Of transport um, has appointed a number of ministers who are actually you know, vocally supportive of active travel, which is good news. So we're we're back on firmer ground. We still have no idea where the money is, when it's coming down the line, if it's going to come down the line, but we hope we're, we're more confident that it is on the way. And that, that amount is 470 million pounds for England uh, alone. And it is all capital spending. And um, we expect hopefully that will appear after the autumn statement. And uh, so going back to the paper, uh, I just want to draw your attention to item 2.2, because actually that's the crux of all of this. Uh, item 2.2 says the investment vision is England will be 
a great walking and cycling nation. Places will be truly walkable. A travel revolution on, in on our streets, towns and communities that will have made cycling a mass form of tra transit. Cycling or walking will be the first choice for many journeys, with half of all journeys in towns and cities being cycled or walked by 2030. So we're talking about a very tight time frame to achieve that goal. And it's generally recognised, uh, certainly at Active Travel England, that most of the heavy lifting for that 50% 50, 50 will be walking rather than cycling. It would take a lot longer to transition people to cycling to get in the uh, to get the infrastructure in place for cycling. So walking is probably certainly uh, going to be doing the heavy lifting. Um, just on the back of that, though, with that ambition has come new tools. So we now have uh, local travel of uh, LTN 120 and we have uh, Manu for Streets 3 on the way. Both of those documents are the key documents for designing infrastructure on our streets. They are the things we should go to when we're going to go. We want to make things better here. You pick up those documents and you find the bits you need. And uh, that, that's all very, they're, they're, they're all very positive. Um, so moving on, the actual, we've, we've already had to outline priorities for Kent County Council. What Kent County Council have decided to do is just carry on with the, with the process of pulling together bids. Uh, they have somewhere in the reach of 100 different bids at the moment. And every district has been asked to submit uh, an initial outline. And then we've been asked to put in some qualitative, qualitative data. So yeah, how, how many pavements do you want? How many meters of pavements do you want to improve? How many crossings do you want? How many, uh, how many cycle tracks do you want? Do you want them on road or off road? All those sort of, sort of uh, figurative uh, issues have been uh, asked. We've also had a meeting with them this week about, um, about the bids that we want to put forward. And I want to talk to you this evening about those bids in a bit more detail. Um, all our bids are concepts. Um, because this is three year funding, we can start with the concept and then go into design and then go into to the real detail, uh, which is a good thing. Uh, it's not like previous active travel funding where we had to go in with plans and had to implement those plans within weeks. It's not like that this time. This is three years of funding. We can go in with, with concepts. We can go with initial thoughts on design. What Active Travel England are looking for are bids that we they know will probably get to the end of the road. They will get delivered. Um, so bids that involve potential land issues aren't going to get anywhere because land issues, as you all probably know, uh, can completely scupper any activities, any interventions. So all our bids, all our bids take place on Kent Highways property or Swales property. Okay, we've focused on that. There are one or two land things, but they're not major issues. And uh, you know, if those arise as a problem, then they can be then they can be edited out. So the priorities focus on our three major conurbations. So they focus on uh, function. And on Faversham, we've looked at ways that we can enhance the walking experience and at the same time uh, uh, emphasise uh, uh, the 20 mile an hour town wide limit that's, that's in place. So when we're talking about walking, we're talking about widening pavements, about getting rid of the roller coaster pavements and giving one level pavement. We're talking about uh, level uh, level crossings. Yeah, same level crossings. So uh, when you cross a road, you don't drop down into it. You actually cross at the same level. Um, uh, an example of that would be at um, uh, South Road, crossing across to cross cross road, cross way, cross lane, cross lane. Thank you. Where we stay at the same level across the road. 
Um, and another example of that would be on uh, Bisingwood Road, where uh, putting in a, a raised zebra crossing for people from uh, people from the I can't think what the names are. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, yeah, all the names are gone. Uh, people from from the Haysbrook side yeah. can cross to the pay, to the play area without having to drop down into the road and, and then access all the stuff that's over on the Davington side. Um, so there, there are two examples. Uh, we're also looking at ways that we can actually reduce the radii of uh, pavements at junctions. So that's, uh, and these are all on networks. And this is another thing we want to emphasize. We're building, this a three year funding program allows us to build these walking and cycling networks. And again, that's a key thing Active Travel England wants to see from us. Um, so moving on, Sheppy. Sheppy's a bit different. Uh, Sheppy, we want, we're, we're suggesting uh, uh, a town-wide 20 mile an hour limit. And we're also looking at more cycling infrastructure on, 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 in the area to better improve the connectivity of Sheerness, Queenborough and Minster. So bringing them closer together using uh, active travel infrastructure and basically building out from existing infrastructure on the Sheerness Way and using that as our spine and going across uh, into Minster, Queenborough and, uh, and really picking up uh, better improvements across those whole areas. And that's more cycling orientated. There are walking elements uh, particularly a uh, place like Marine Parade, where we're trying to improve the crossings. Uh, again, using raised crossings rather than uh, uh, drop curves. Um, and some of the major investments will actually come from looking at the junction outside the station and seeing how we can improve the routes from uh, the, the high streets, um, Millennium Way. Oh, you should get that word wrong. Millennium Way um, and Railway Road uh, and really improved that for active travel so people could actually walk and cycle across that junction far more safely, particularly getting to Sheffield, uh, Beachfields and uh, Tesco's, which is basically almost a car, totally car orientated location at the moment. And then we come on to Sittingbourne. Cityborne, uh, it's a mix of walking and cycling initiatives. So, um, and actually, this is where things get a little bit trickier because we're trying to improve the, uh, the movement between movement across the railway. And obviously, we've got to have network rails involvement in that. Thankfully, they're being very helpful at the moment. Okay. It must be the time of year, I don't know. But um, they they are talking to us and they are, I mean, their next funding round doesn't start until 2024. So we're getting in now to say, look, we need all this sort of thing, all these things improved over the course uh, in that next round of funding in 2024. Um, and of course, a lot of that is down to uh, the underpasses, making them more secure because at the moment, they're not. Um, they're quite scary places on dark nights, last nights. Have a nice walk home. Yes. <laughs> but uh, and another thing with with Sittingbourne, um, I think we've got the space to actually put in uh, on-road cycle tracks, uh, improving um, connectivity uh, across east, west, and north, south. And that's uh, something we're working with Kent Highways with to make sure we've got the space and the ability to do that. Uh, initially, that will be um, using uh, wands and things rather than going straight in with 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 digging roads up and uh, putting in, in curbs and things. But, but I think that is much more achievable in Sittingbourne than it is in any other part of the borough. So where are we now? If actually Trump Fund 4 goes ahead, uh, which we expect to do now, to maximise that opportunity, we may have to be very nimble. We may have to, we may be back to sort of deadlines of 
days rather than weeks or months uh, because we're moving towards the end of the financial year. And obviously all those decisions need to be made by the end of the financial year. So consequently, we have uh, two recommendations tonight. The first one is to agree the outlines three priority schemes for parish and GNS and City Hall. The second one is to de delegate the submission of the final act of travel fund for priorities to the head of regeneration, economic development and property in consultation with the chair of the committee. Thank you. Thank you, Adrian. That's a very good overview for us. Um, are there questions? Councillor Davies. Thank you, thank you, Adrian. Huh? And thank you for our walk. <laughs> okay. Very thank you for the invite. It was uh, an interesting walk. Uh, just a couple of quick questions. Mm. I appreciate the point you made about land. There is a, a project on the island to try and bring the old light railway route back into use. Is that going to be included or not beyond the budget? Um, uh, beyond budget, beyond the time scope. Okay. And uh, um, on, on sitting ball, um, well, I think it's called the death row. Sitting ball in Milton count as one urban conservation as far as the, um, the rural England prosperity parking counts. So do your, do your plans there with the, the 20 mile an hour limit go beyond sitting ball to have a sense and into Milton because they have been requested that in the past? Yeah, with the 20 mile an hour areas uh, in Sittingbourne, what I'm focusing on are residential areas. So taking, uh, so taking take someone like Kendry and saying everything off the main road is actually 20 miles an hour. Right. Uh, so and, and keeping the main roads at 30. So particularly, and that, perhaps a better example is on the A2. So as you head east on the A2. All the housing on the right would be 20 mile an hour home zone. All the housing on the left would be 20 mile an hour home zone, but the A2 itself would stay at 30. And indeed, sorry if I couldn't come back to you. Mm. Uh, is, is there enough within the budget to do that? Or is it going to involve a lot of work with KCC on that? Uh, well, lots of work with KCC. Yeah. Um, and we are talking, we're going big here. We're, okay. going, we're going multi million. Oh, okay. Well, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Hampshire. Thank, thank you, Chairman. Um, I mean, in this paper is primarily all indicated around drawing up a bid with various schemes that you might get grant proposals for. And in that table on page 88, it says about having comprehensive plans in place, not just for those leadership and new initiatives, but actually having comprehensive plans in place. What I'm not seeing at the moment, and forgive me, maybe it's just an oversight and it exists, is how maybe we're using some of that the local plan to help build this in. Because you know, many developments may have great schemes for the development, but it's actually how does that then connect up mm -hmm. into the wider community? And you know, with a lot of this about you know the power we link up rural areas with you know urban conurbations and how to then link up those urban conurbations. With say where the places of employment, surely there is some scope to build in develop contributions and help with the delivery of this, so that it's not just relying on the grant funding, but actually maybe using the, the opportunities available that, that come from Section 106 or whatever yeah. the new thing there. Yeah. Obviously, Joe, it yeah. comes to that Jack liability issue as well, isn't it? The more you ask from the developer, the more likely to get a reduced quality of build. Potentially. So it's a difficult one, but that seems to be lacking. And I just don't know whether that's an oversight, whether it exists or it's something like actually, no, it's a really good idea. I'm going to think how I can maybe do that and put it into the bid so that I move up those levels where my bid will actually be maybe more successful. Yeah, just come back on that. I'm happy to. Um, so it's an interesting thing. Uh, what we're doing is putting an enormous bid on the basis of knowing that that will be edited down. Probably first by KCC and then by Action Travel England. However, once we've pulled all that information together, we've got it. And we can go to developers and say, look, you're putting something there. We have plans to put this here. We want some Section 106 or Section 273 money to, to actually deliver that. Um, and all of, all of this activity will come from a cocktail of funding. Will not, all this funding will not come from one place deliver this. 
come on. It will be a cocktail of funding. And it's it's once we've, we've drawn up you know the bids and we've got Kent on our side. Say that confidently. We've got Kent on our side. You know, we it, it's much easier to move forward. Get those 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 additional funding, and we just don't know where the next lot round of funding is going to come from. We, the government has uh, a seaweed, a sort of seaweed, rubbish name, slightly walking investment strategy, seaweed, um, which actually articulates 3.8 billion between now and uh, 2025. Now we only know where two billion of that is coming from at the moment, which is from active travel and department travel. The 1.8 billion, no idea where that's going to come from. Um, and it'll be interesting to see where that comes from. But there are other sources of funding we will be targeting to actually achieve our goals. It just the suspension of the more steps. Mm. It seems to me that you're going to the bid first, see the news lines up, and then, okay, how can I figure out where the approach? But sometimes when you go for major bids, as an element of match funds, it actually makes the bid more successful. Sometimes. Um, because it shows a real commitment to delivering the scheme, and it's mm. very easy if something's going to cost a lot just to rule it out completely. And mm. you know, you want to be successful at the end of the day. Mm. And I've heard earlier on this evening about conditions that have been placed for developers to achieve certain build qualities that maybe achieve a higher degree of environmental friendliness. Surely, part and parcel of that is initiatives towards active travel. And could the council, whilst it has a foreign level plan in place at the moment, be looking at ways where maybe conditions could be utilised to actually build up the pot to help that development become integrated where it is going to be in place in the, in, in the future. And that there is a, a reserve there ready to go, which then, you know, when the map, when the funding bid comes through and you know what you've got, you kind of a bit further forward and then you play catch up if you get what, what I'm trying to say. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I mean, what I, what I would say to that is, is that's exactly why Adrian sent me in that chair. So, <laughs> oh, having, having, you know, senior management team have talked with, with, you know, ed, almost every councillor over the last five years about, and I hate the term having these other ready bids, but <laughs> it's, um, the reason that we are employing specialists like Adrian is, is for exactly that reason. And I, I, I think, I think Adrian, you mentioned it in your introduction, there is some money outside of active travel mm. or that's helping us yeah. get some consultancy in that will get us to that point of more detailed design. But you're absolutely right. Policy is everything in terms of setting direction. Now, um, all of those conversations are happening. So I know Adrian is well looped in, as is as was Janet, as are uh, the air quality guys within those policy decisions that the, the local plans team have been working on and, and continue to work on. So there is a really good connection now across the authority and not just going as a, as a planner's thing. Just to re emphasize that, really. A lot of my job is joining the dots, um, and so yeah, I mean, it is about being the glue that sort of works with, yeah, you know, planning and policy and um, uh, all sorts of other areas. Because when when you do that, certainly with in this environment, you know, all sorts of things open up, and all things, all sorts of things become possible that perhaps weren't possible before. So that's yeah, it is about joining the dots. It's about talking to the right people. Um, you know, we were talking earlier about um, you know, you know, bigger, bigger uh, uh, developments that come down the line. Dutchy is now going out in consultation at the moment. Um, I've been involved with with the pre-planned meetings probably since I arrived. So you know, it, and and with developments like that, it's actually saying. To the developer, not put this active travel link in into your development and across your development. Yeah, you know, when you reach number three hundred one of your dwellings, it's put it in now before everything else. Before you, so put it in first, so it end that the first person who moves on to that development can start using it from day one. And that's the sort of policy and changes we need to make sure happen. 
Okay, thanks very much, Adrian. Uh, so we've got two recommendations here to agree the outline three priority schemes with Habersham, Sheerness and Sittingbourne and to get delegate the submission of the final active travel bid to the head of regeneration in cons consultation with me as the chair. Can I have someone to propose that? Councillor Davey, second. Are we all happy? Thank you. So that moves us to item. OK, yeah, thank you, Adrian. That moves us to item eight, which is the forward decisions plan. Do you want to say anything in relation to this? I, I don't think there's a huge change from, from the one that we looked at previously, to, uh, to be honest. So we've got two items for the... Um, we've obviously got the... I've just, no, I can't. Again, I can't go without talking about waste. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be aware we've got the extraordinary meeting for the 19th of December, um, which will focus on the, the waste contract tender. Um, but the next formal committee of uh, the Environment Committee is the January one. Um, so, two items planned for that the um, very early review of the existing open space and place strategy. Um, Chair reminded me that actually the play element of that probably sits with the communities committee um, now, so I have to split myself in two. Um, but uh, so certainly, what the, the aim with that one is very much bring along the existing policy and, and have a, a real um, old PDRC type discussion around some of the key principles within that policy, and then the team can go away and. Um, start to re review it and re amend it for, for the next five years. And then the car club, you heard some uh, some updates on the Faversham one from uh, from Janet earlier. And so it's about exploring potential opportunities for, for and sitting board in the future. Uh, so they're the two key items. The air quality action plan that you heard about earlier and put out to consultation when that consultation closes, so it won't make the January one, um, but we're aiming for the, for the next meeting after that, ideally, to, to bring back the results of that consultation. Um, and then at the moment, um, further, the public toilet opening, closing, cleaning contract is up for renewal um, following uh, March. So we want to bring, just Around about May, May, June time, whenever the next committee of this sits after after the election, we want to bring um, a paper to discuss the potential changes. Whether we like it, don't like it, to the public convenience of the contract itself. So. That's it. Okay. Are you going to promote the brief briefings? I, I'm, yeah, I'm going to maybe leave that for you. But um, <laughs> I'm, I'm told by my democratic colleagues that they they've had a very good response. Um, so we obviously at the last environment committee, you guys uh, considered a paper which was a bit of an update on the, the waste tender process. There was a recommendation within that to hold member briefings for the whole whole, whole of the council. Um, we've taken on board the virtual nature. I think asbestos might have helped slightly with that as well. Um, but the um, so there were both the teams meetings. Uh, we put one in uh, one in the evening. So next. Monday evening, the seventh is uh, seven o'clock. Is the first one of those briefings, and then the following Monday, an afternoon slot, four o'clock as well. You're welcome to come to both. I would probably say the same thing, almost verbatim in both. So, <laughs> yes, sir. Um, I will have the help of Alistair on on that one as well. But that will really take you right up to today. Uh, of where we are with the waste tender, so that it gives you as much um, as much pre-site or foresight before the the 19th of December meeting. Okay, thank you, Martin. Are we happy to note the forward decision? Okay. Thank you. So I think that's the uh, end of the meeting then. So uh, uh, we'll close the meeting. Thank you, everyone. Safe journey home.